like him in his death. So we come to this moment. It's Friday, the third hour. Jewish time starts at 6 in the morning, and so it's 9 a.m. when they nail Jesus to the cross. The charge against him, the king of the Jews, was scrawled across a sign. Along with him, they crucified two criminals, one to his right, the other to his left. People passing along the road jeered, shaking their heads in mock lament. You brag that you could tear down the temple and then rebuild it in three days. So show us your stuff. Save yourself. If you're really God's son, come down from that cross. The high priests, along with the religious scholars, were right there mixing it up with the rest of them, having a great time poking fun at him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Messiah is he? King of Israel? Then let him climb down from that cross. We'll all become believers then. Even the men crucified alongside him joined in the mockery. At noon, the sky became extremely dark. The darkness lasted three hours. At three o'clock, Jesus groaned out of the depths, crying loudly, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders who heard him said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran off, soaked a sponge in sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But Jesus, with a loud cry, gave his last breath. At that moment, the temple curtain ripped right down the middle. When the Roman captain standing guard in front of him saw that he had quit breathing, he said, this has to be the Son of God. When Jesus had cried out with a loud cry, He breathed his last. And in this moment, we see the humanity of Jesus. The agony he endured, and he took the full wrath, he took the full anger, he took the full discipline of God, knowing full well what he had to do, knowing the pain, knowing the abandonment, knowing the suffering that he was going to endure. And when Jesus made his triumphant entry on the first day of the week, No one expected this is where he would end up on Friday. That he was the Messiah that was promised by God, the one that they thought would overtake Rome to establish himself as king, and yet here he is, suffering a criminal's death. How could this be what God had planned? How could this be something better? But this is what God had planned. A price had to be paid so that the righteous requirement of the law could be met in us. Christ had to suffer and die. It's on the cross we see the humanity of Jesus, but it's also because of the cross that we can know the love of God. That for God so loved the world, he gave us his son. That whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. And what breaks my heart sometimes is that Christ died for all, and yet so many don't know the love of God. See, if someone died for you, wouldn't you want to know who that person was? If someone willingly gave up their life for you so that you could live, wouldn't you want to know them? And then wouldn't that change your perspective? Wouldn't that change the way you view life? It might reorient your priorities. It might help you see what matters most. The Apostle Paul describes such an experience as he had a dramatic shift in perspective after coming to know this Jesus who died for him. I want you to listen to the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 3. He says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, 
but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Now these verses show us something extremely important about the heart of Paul. See, Paul's desire in verse 10 was to know him. His heart cry was to know God more and more. And even as a mature believer, Paul never came to a place where he felt like he knew enough of God. And I would bet for most of us in this room, we've likely had a personal relationship with Jesus for a while. And yet I wonder if many of us over the years of following Christ, if we sort of lose that pursuit of him, and we lose that hunger to know him and we get content with where we're at and maybe we put our relationship with Jesus on cruise control. But it's up to us how much we want to know God. I like this quote from A.W. Tozer where he says, every man is as close to God as he wants to be. You see, for Paul, knowing Christ was the most valuable thing he could pursue in this life. So much so that he says all of the cherished treasures in his gain column suddenly became deficits. That when he became a Christian, the things that he used to glory in, his reputation, his popularity, his achievements, his confidence in himself, all of those things became eclipsed. And his goal now was to know Christ. Everything else looked like garbage to Paul compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. And what kind of knowing did Paul want? Well, he didn't want a second-hand experience. He longed for a personal fellowship. And he also wanted a painful fellowship. It says in verse 10 that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings. Do you hear that? That I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. See, it's not knowing that honey is sweet because someone has told me, but it's knowing that honey is sweet because I just put a spoonful of it in my mouth and I've tasted of it. That's the kind of knowing that Paul wants. He wants to share in the sufferings of Christ. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the strangeness of that desire. This just seems like a very strange desire on Paul's part, doesn't it? That he would want to know Christ in such a way as to taste of his suffering. I mean, why would anyone desire that? You might think that Paul would desire the power to avoid or escape suffering, especially sitting in a jail cell on death row. But instead, Paul longs to know Christ by sharing in his suffering. And this is actually one of the most dominant ideas of Paul and in the entire Bible, the call to die with Christ. It's all over the Bible, and I just want to read a few passages for you. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 9. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Galatians 2.20 it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I die every day. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Our hardships are like experiencing with him his death day by day. In Romans 8, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
And I recognize that some people have a really hard time with this, with a theology of suffering. That why would a good God allow me to suffer? And for some people, this is a major roadblock to a relationship with Jesus. They, they can't understand why a good God would want that, would allow that. And some would believe that God's only will for you is to live happy, healthy, and wealthy, and anything outside of that is not from him. That is not the call to follow Christ. That we are called to die to self and to suffer with Christ. Because following Christ is not a plan for self-improvement. It is a call to die. It's not the power to avoid suffering or to go around it or jump over it, but it's the strength and the power to endure it. Because whether we want to or not, whether we like to admit it or not, we are all going to face difficult times. It's just a part of life. And nowhere here is Paul saying that suffering is good for you. But what he's telling us is that suffering leads to a deep knowing and a deep fellowship with Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that everyone has to be persecuted the way Paul was persecuted or suffer the same way that Christ suffered. But whatever we experience in life by way of trial or hardship, we must experience it with him. And instead of turning on him and shaking our fist in his face, that we endure it with him. We invite Jesus into it. You see, all the sufferings that Paul experienced drove him to deeper fellowship with Jesus. That's why he can write with such joy from a prison cell. Paul actually considers suffering to be a gift. He says this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. He says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. It's been granted to you. It's been graced to you that you should suffer with Christ. It's a gift with a big bow on it. And the gift in our suffering is that we get to know Christ in a way like nothing else allows us to experience him. That there is such an intimacy with God to be found during times of difficulty that we never have in the lighter times of life. And I don't know about you, but during some of the most difficult seasons in my life, those are the times that I have experienced the presence of Jesus the most. And I'll be the first to admit that I don't welcome that kind of suffering. I don't welcome the suffering that draws me that close. I would prefer to know about Christ's sufferings intellectually rather than through experience. And oftentimes, if you're like me in the midst of pain, you just, you want relief. We want the pain to go away. Or perhaps we harden up or we pull away from God. But when we invite him into our suffering, something shifts within us. That our hearts become more aligned with his. That we walk a road of suffering with him. Our suffering leads to fellowship with Christ because there is no suffering we can experience that our Lord cannot relate to. We worship a God who knows our pain because he suffered far more than we ever will. That on the cross, Jesus bore the ultimate loss, a loss greater than anyone had ever experienced, that he gave up heaven, he gave up his divine nature, he emptied himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross. That he endured far more intense persecution and suffering than anyone else who ever lived. All of it undeserved. And he did it so that we could gain forgiveness, reconciliation, and eternal life. Christ lost everything so that we could gain everything. And even in the midst of suffering, we have everything we need in Christ. It changes the way we view suffering 
when we see that it can lead to deeper fellowship with Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul, the same guy who wrote this passage in Philippians, he mentioned that he lived with a thorn in his flesh. Now, we don't exactly know what that was. It could have been a physical ailment. It could have been a sickness or a disease or persecution or hardship that he was facing. But it was something that he lived with daily that brought him a great deal of suffering. And it says in in chapter 12 in, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, his perspective about his thorn in the flesh changed. And in his suffering, he experienced a peace and the power and the strength of God to endure it. And for Paul, the suffering actually became his boast. And if you have something like this in your life, a thorn in the flesh, I don't know what that might be for you. Perhaps it's a season of deep pain and loss. Maybe it's a physical condition, could be a health condition. Maybe it's shame or guilt or sin, regrets, broken relationships. In our pain, we have a unique invitation to know the Lord Jesus more deeply by inviting him into that suffering. And through that, we can have such a deep knowing and intimacy with God. Because when we look at the cross, it represents a God who understands our suffering. And a God who understands our suffering is a God who can be trusted. So what place of suffering could you invite Jesus into today? Well, as you consider that, we're going to move into a time of response by taking the Lord's Supper together. The bread representing Christ's body that was given for us and the cup representing Christ's blood that was shed for us. And so as Pastor Scott and the team lead us in worship, I just want to invite you when you're ready, you can come. You can make your way up one of the center aisles. You can receive the bread and cup from our communion servers and then just exit along the, the, the aisles along the wall. We'll try to keep a smooth traffic flow just up the middle and out the sides. And if you need a gluten-free option, you can just let our servers know that and they'll have something for you here. And when you get back to your seat with the elements, I just invite you to let the Holy Spirit lead you. You can sit there for a little bit if you'd like to reflect, to pray, to worship. And then when you're ready, on your own, you don't need to wait till we've all been served, but whenever you're ready, just go ahead and partake of the elements. And lastly, I just want to mention that this table is for those that have submitted their lives to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And so if if you haven't done that yet, We're glad you're here, but I would just invite you, give you the freedom to sit and observe, but I would still encourage you to engage with us. You might want to ask the Lord what he might want to say to you or speak to you in these moments, or if you feel like the Holy Spirit is nudging you, maybe you want to give your life to Jesus today, you could come up to the front. I'll be standing over here. Some of our prayer team will. We'd love to pray with you to receive Jesus. So I'll invite our communion servers. You can make your way to the front. And as we come to the table, I want to read 1 Corinthians 11. This is what Paul says. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice on the cross that you willingly suffered and died and gave your life for us. And God, you call us to suffer with Christ. And would you help us to see that every time we walk in our own suffering, that we have the opportunity to invite Jesus into that and experience him in a way like nothing else. It's because no one understands our pain better than you. And so as we take this time to remember your sacrifice around the table, I invite your Holy Spirit to come and fill us fresh today. Thank you for your love and for your grace. We love you and we worship you. Meet us now in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand, and when you're ready, you can come and receive the elements.